go through my, my little presentation, I have a question to ask you. The gentleman that always is asking the questions, can I ask what you do? I mean, you're sitting there asking all these questions. I honestly would like to know what you do. Just so I know how to gear my, gear my questions. Um, you're sorry? An LAU student. Uh, studying? What are you studying? Math education. Excellent. 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 All right. That's why he's asking too many questions. All right. That's fine. Well, thank you for coming. And, uh, you know, I hope you enjoy what I have to say over the next 30 to 35 minutes. First of all, uh, who's recording this lecture? Yes? So if anyone's recording this lecture, you really don't have to because we're already recording it. It'll be published on our website uh, in about a week to 10 days after, the, after Teacher's Day. Uh, so just to go back and refer to it. Any questions? On our website. It'll be on our website, yes. It'll be on our website. It'll be on the Eastwood College website, which is eastwoodcollege.com. All right. Uh, my name is Michelle Corey. Thank you very much for the lovely introduction. I am the director of Eastwood College, and I've been the director for about a year and a half now. I've been working for the school for about three years, um, and we've seen Eastwood College transform drastically and rapidly. And honestly, it's because of teachers just like you. It's because of teachers that have that passion, that have that vision, who are forward thinkers, that want to do something different, that want to think differently, that want to transform the way you're teaching your kids. So I want to tell you a few five facts that I think make Eastwood College successful. We've, we were established in 1973 by Mr. Amir Khouri, who's my father. Uh, so we've been around for 40 years. We actually celebrate our 40th year anniversary this year. The second interesting fact is our average classroom size is 15 students. And in the early childhood uh, departments, the maximum classroom size is 15 students. So we don't allow more than 15 students in that department. And as we grow, uh, as, as the kids move forward 10th, 11th, and 12th grades, we have a maximum of 20 to 25 kids. So we have small classroom sizes. And that's a variable, that's a very important variable of success of any school. The third uh, important variable of our success is we have a young faculty, we have a young staff. Our average teacher age is 36 years old. We're all young and they're energetic and they're dynamic, but they're experts in their fields. Just like you're studying math technology, all of our other teachers have expertise in their fields. And fourth, we are the first school in the Middle East, and we're proud of that, to have a full iPad program. And what a full iPad program means is that all our curriculum from grades 7 through 12 is completely on an iPad. So we no longer use books, well, with the exception of Arabic books, which now we are working with publishers to, uh, to, tra to transfer them into, uh, uh, into iOS software. Uh, but we are the first school in the Middle East to have developed this technology. We currently have about 135 students and about 55 faculty members that are working on the iPad. And next year, we're developing that program from grades 5 through 12. And we're even expanding it to our second campus, which is our Kashima campus. So we'll have about 1,000 iPads deployed, a one-to-one -one iPad program. And fifth, and above all, what makes us more successful, and which I think we're very successful, is we are a family. We are not an institution. We love each and every single member of our family. Whether they are children, faculty members, administrators, everyone in the Eastwood community is our family member. So, a lot of people are asking about this iPad program, and I want to spend a few minutes going through the rationale of why we're doing what we're doing at Eastwood. And I hope it's something that explains a little bit about not just what's happening here, today, but what's happening broadly across cultures in this new age of information. And I want to start off with something really interesting. It's a postcard by this French artist named Villemar. And what he did is, there's a series of these postcards, and they were, he drew them in 1910, visualizing the year 2000. Now, who of you have seen these postcards before? 
So there's a whole series of these postcards. So this artist, French artist, in 1910, drew a series of them, visualizing the year, what the year 2000 would be. And look at this. This is fascinating. This is a young gentleman sitting with a microphone, talking to his lady friend who's being projected on some sort of gizmo projector on a whiteboard while he's listening to her on the ear, on, on, on the, on the uh, speaker to his left. It's amazing. But what Vimar always fail, Vimar always, almost gets that technology right every single time in each and every single one of his postcards. But what he fails to understand is that a change in technology will change everything, and especially the underclass. And this is another uh, postcard I like as well. It's a group of students on the left and a teacher on the right sitting and cranking books through this machine. And God knows what, how, how they're using this technology or how you're, how, what, what these kids are actually listening to. But it seems to me like this is the 18th century version of podcasting. Fascinating. But also, almost always gets the technology right, but fails to understand that there is an underclass. So we see this poor boy right here, sitting and cranking. Sitting and cranking. Because he didn't have the privilege to be educated. He didn't have that privilege to be one of these kids. And I'd like to start off as this starting point, and I want to use it off because it's important for us to understand that what we, when we talk about change that are, that's happening, we're talking not just about change in technology, but a change in culture, and then a change in the way we understand the world today. So a few years ago, before I started this entire iPad journey of ours, who, who do you know that we have a full iPad program? Just raise your hands. All right, little people, not too many. So, I wanted to get to the core of how technology was, how technology started. And most importantly, how technology was started in education. So what I did, through computers, so we have a, an answer, an estimated guess, but not quite as right. So, technology started back in the year almost 2000, like almost 2000 years ago with the scroll. And what's interesting about this is, uh, I don't know who, rem who do you guys know what the scroll is? I mean, obviously you guys do, right? All right, okay. So, to move from the scroll to the codex, so the movement from the scroll to the codex was a transformational technology at that time. And do all of you know what a codex is? For those who don't, codex is a book that people actually used to write in and carry around with them. So every time they get information, they sit and write it in their codex book. So what we know, and what's interesting here is that the codex was a very portable device. While the scroll had no structural integrity, the codex had a binder, was sort of like a book, and was able to be mobile. And what we know is that over 2,000 years ago, people were interested in mobility. And they wanted to carry around information with them. So that was the first reason. Second reason is that a scroll is a linear access device. In order for you to get to the end of the scroll, you actually have to scroll all the way down to the end. While the book was a random access device, you could open up a book, put three or three, two or three fingers, flip back and forth through the pages, and get to the information when you needed it, and whenever you needed it, how you needed it. So that's something that I'd like to share with all my staff uh, when we started to, when we take a look at technology. And there's nothing new about this. The desire to carry stuff with us and access it when we need it and how we need it is important. And I'd like to take a look at, and use this as a base concept to our journey. So through the scroll, what we can safely assume is that in this age, the age of hands, when everyone was sitting and writing in their codex, it was the first age of information. And this was the only way to transmit information. But it was the only type of technology we had to distribute information. And in this age, because technology was so hard to obtain, we developed a special way of teaching. It's called lecturing. And what lecturing is, 
is was that a teacher would stand at the, big, at the front of the class and would actually recite and recite his book so that the students were able to write everything he would say. Is that what lecturing is? So they can make their own copy and carry that book with them around. And there was no other way to achieve information. And it was hard to get information that was not immediately around me at that time. So let's say I was in Lebanon and I needed information from, let's say, Syria or Iraq. What I would actually have to do is physically get there, figure out the information, write it down in my codex, and then head back. And it would take, the journey would take months, and if not years, because the trans, because uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, community, the, the barriers to uh, the travel were impossible. You either had to walk, take a camel, a mule, or probably swim. So there were a few people that at that time that could create. Not everyone could create. Not everyone had the language skills to be able to sit and work through a codex and write. And even fewer people were able to consume. <laughs> Because if you were the creator, it doesn't necessarily mean that you were also the cons you were the consumer because you may not know, you may not have known how to read. So the important, most significant problem of the first age was access. Accessing information was the chief difficulty in this age, the age of hands. And I want to walk you through what it was like teaching in the first age. So there are some particular characteristics that I want you to think about, about the age of teaching and learning. So learning happened in these processes. So the teachers lived and worked together. There was no particular division between class time or home time or work time. They were all blended together. Students lived with their instructors, with their master instructors. Think of how many students lived and worked with master artists to become master artists. They would have probably lived with them for 10, 15, 20 years, some of them a lifetime. <laughs> Learning was embodied, it was all about people working together. It was very subjective, very individualized, and it was interconnected, but above all, it was very dialectic. A lot of dialogue between the master and the teacher and the student. And dialogue was the only way to get this information across. But there was one, one major problem still, access to information. Until our friend Johannes Gutenberg solves the problem by inventing the first printing press at about 1450. And for the first time in human history, he solves the problem of access. So what Gutenberg did was set up a printing press and was able to produce book after book after book after book that all looked the same. And he was able to produce books in quantities. And for the first time in human history, lots of people had access to information. And now we get these giant libraries, huge, humongous libraries, filled with not hundreds of thousands, but millions and millions of books. But now we think of a different problem. If we have millions and millions of books, how do you find anything? So the problem of the second age was finding. So finding becomes the central problem of the second age, the age of books. So we, what we did as human beings is we invented technology to help us find these books. Now who remembers this picture? Who remembers this picture? Exactly, exactly. Do you know what this is? This is a card catalog. Do you understand the complexities of this technology? So in order for you to research Leonardo da Vinci, what would you have to do? You first need to know what the hell his name was. Was it Leonardo? Was it da Vinci? Was it Vinci? Was it the Vinci? And you would have to walk up to this card catalog, and after you realize what his real name is, or how the library thought his name was, you would open up, for example, Da Vinci, under D, you would open up this huge drawer, 
Look up Da Vinci. Da, 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 da. All right, Da Vinci, here we are. But we're not at our information yet. So what we would have to do is we'd have to take this piece of paper with Da Vinci and write down the call number, the reference number, and the particular area of the library. But we're still not in our time. We're still not, we still haven't found the information. So what we do then is we take this and we walk around the library. All right, this is the particular side of the, oh, here we are. We found the part of the library that holds this book, but we're still not in the information. And then now we would have to actually sit and sift through all these millions of books, take the book out, open the book, flip through the pages, just to say, oh my God, this is not what I'm looking for. <laughs> so what happens now? And it would take months and months to figure out or even to write a dissertation or a thesis. I mean, how many of you had to write a dissertation using this type of technology? And in this world, teachers would basically act like a signpost guiding their students as to where to look for this information, where to find this information. So the teaching in the second age looked something like this. In the new age, in, the, in, in this age, we saw a very different model. In this model, teachers served as the primary conduits of information. And they did that because they were helping to try to solve this problem of finding. I actually want you to think, as I'm talking, how each of these relate to you, and how each of these five or four or five categories relate to your classrooms right now. And we focused on classifi uh, classification and cataloging because the most important thing we could do is understand how this system worked. That's how you could find the information you were looking for. And we focused on memorization. And the reason that we focused on memorization is the more information we carried in our heads was the, last time, was the less time looking for it in the library. So because memorization was so important, we focused on repetition. And that was the primary thing, and not analysis. So students would repeat back to the teachers exactly what the teachers told them. Time after time after time after time. And funny enough, that was called assessment. How many of you are living in this model today? Unfortunately, a lot of us are. And for the first time, we were learning from objects and not people. And we knew this because when I walk into a classroom and I give my students a topic that I had researched back home and told them about, for example, Da Vinci and the way he was ambidextrous. And my students would walk up to me and say, well, sir, that's not in the book. This is the first time that students were actually being uh, learning from books and not teachers. And learning from the first time became standardized because all the books were standardized. So the book true is the universal basis to education, and that is a wonderful thing. And for the first time, millions and millions of people had access to information, and not just consumers, but as producers. How many of you have written research papers that are published? How many of you have written books that are published? How easy is it to publish now? And the book opened up information from all parts of the world. And instead of me having to travel, remember our little travel to Syria or Iraq? The information could come to me now because it was mobile. But that's not the age we live in now. The age of memorization and standardization has passed because that finding the thing problem has been solved. And the third age, the age of data. And what's funny enough is we all use iPads. We all have some sort of technology in our classrooms. But I want to walk you through the teaching model. So what does teaching and learning look like in the third age? Let me walk you through it real quickly. First of all, we're seeing this in a lot of different ways. Teaching needs to become relational again. 
Students and teachers are able to collaborate and communicate in lots of different ways that were not even possible a few years ago. We have to focus on contextual learning and thinking on how to apply models in different situations. And if, if information is expanding so rapidly and so quickly, then what we need to be doing is not teaching information, but how to apply information in learning models. So when the information changes, students are able to adapt different information, new information, to the, to the same models. Repetition and assessment needs to lead to people to operate independently, to think for themselves. Are we doing that in our classrooms? Are we helping students think for themselves? Or are we just repeating to them what the book says? And learning needs to be interconnected and not just chopped up into small pieces. And learning needs to bring all those pieces together. And if this list sounds remotely familiar, it's because it's the same list that we started off with 2,000 years ago. Very dialectic. Very personalized. So what I did to go through my journey, again, is I wanted to research a how technology has transformed industry. And I thought of plenty of different industries, and I like, honestly, the medical industry. So what I did is I actually Googled surgery rooms in the 1800s, and I found this. I mean, I don't know what the hell they're doing to this guy. He probably has a broken leg, probably, I, I, honestly, I don't know. And then what I did is Google 21st century operating rooms and I found this. I mean, this is the transformation of technology in a surgery room. And what I did next was expand that search and I said, how has technology transformed, for example, the cotton industry or manufacturing? And I found this. Who remembers these pictures? We've all come across them. And then what I did, and I'm sorry for this picture, it's a little bit smaller than usual. This is a 21st century uh, cotton mill. So imagine the transformation of technology in these types of industries. And then what I wanted to do was take it a step further. And I wanted to take it to education. And this is an educational classroom, taken about a picture taken about 100 years ago. Looks awesome. Nice kids, this guy's wearing a tie back there also as well. All nice and well behaved. <laughs> Some of us which don't have that luxury anymore. And then what I did is I actually took a picture from last week. Do you see what the problem is? It's almost exactly the same. With the exception of a new coat of paint and bigger windows. So technology, what we've realized is technology has not transformed are learning and teaching at all, and not in the least bit. And the reasons behind this was, the way, the, the, the reasons that I could come up with is, it was too costly, it was very cumbersome, it was very tricky. And then I started thinking, why? Although Eastwood's first, Eastwood College's first laboratory, computer lab, was created in 1986, back to my records that I saw, I went around over the past year, actually before I started the iPad program, and actually checked to see how computers were being used in the classroom. And we did have computers in each and every single classroom. And to my surprise, I found one computer that was actually being used as a door stopper. <laughs> and I started thinking, why haven't we used technology in the classroom a lot more? And then I thought of, okay. Well, this is my stream of thought of purchasing technology in a classroom. Well, do I go with the Mac or do I go with the PC? If I go with the PC, do I get the Windows 8, Windows 9, Windows 15, Windows 16, Windows 86, Windows 97? I don't know. And if I did go with the Mac, do I go with a big Mac, a small Mac, a huge Mac? I don't know what types of, a purple Mac, a green Mac. But the problem didn't stop there. It continued. When I wanted to purchase software, I had to make sure that this software, did this software work with the Mac I purchased? Windows 98 operating system, or Windows 2000, or Windows 96, or Windows 200 million? Or did it work only on a Mac? And if I did purchase that software, how costly was it? 
And if I did not like it, could I return it? And these are some of the questions that maybe we don't necessarily ask. But some of these questions, to, at least to the administrators, people were asking themselves, why aren't we using technology enough in the classrooms? And why did we have to wait till this year, or last year, or tomorrow, or next year to start implementing technology? And I think these are some of the reasons. And what we need to do is we need to not create factories for learning, and we need to blow up this idea and create laboratories. This is a picture. Actually, who knows this picture? This is a very famous picture. Anyone? Anyone? This is a picture that my father loves to use, and, and, and the story he loves to use when he's giving talks. This is a picture of the first modern laboratory. It's Thomas Edison's laboratory. Thomas Edison created, created it because he went through about 10,000 experiments looking for the right thing to service the light bulb. And what he realized is that he did not know what he wanted until he really needed it. So in his laboratory, he actually had a pipe organ because he never knew when he needed a little bit of pipe, little pipe organ music. And what's interesting about this is our students have laboratories, fully connected laboratories at their disposal in this day and age. And this is the world in the hands of our students. This is the world in the hands of a mobily equipped student in the 21st century, in the year 2013, where not only do they carry a thousand songs on their iPods or iPads, but they carry a thousand libraries. They carry a thousand applications and a thousand educational videos. And we need to see the shift. And what we need is, we need a world where books are transformed. And not just static standard books, but books that are interactive and customizable to students' experiences and needs and learning objectives because we all know that students learn in different ways. And we all know that students have different capacities and different mental capabilities and different skills and not all students are created equal. And we need, a course that is mi we need courses that are mixable and that are socially connected so classrooms become places of discussion, of dialogue, and of learning, true learning. And we need teaching that is just as flexible as these books that we need to create. So teaching that allows lots and lots of people to come together and lots of people to create. Ask yourself this question, what are you doing inside your classroom? to engage students in a more active way. Thank you, Professor. The only way to solve the world problems is through information. And let's take a look at something like climate change. Is it a technological problem? Absolutely. Is it a social problem? Of course. Is it an economic problem? Yes. Is it a culture problem? Is it a historical problem? Is it an aesthetics problem? Yes. So what we need are not people to give slim definitions of information, but people who understand broader definitions. We need people who can connect things together. The problem of the current world are so complex that people who cannot operate together will fail. People who cannot come together in community and learn and collaborate together as students will fail. What are you doing in your classrooms to succeed? Because the way we've transformed learning at Eastwood College, we're seeing a difference. And the difference is fascinating. And true, it was radical change, and true, it did cost a little bit more. But what we're seeing now is a new type of student. A student that is engaged. A student that is knowledgeable. A student that has so much information in his fingertips that he has every possibility to change this world. And I'd like to think about this guy for a second. Who knows who Sugata Mitra is? One, two, one. 
All right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you two minutes to find out who Sugata the Mitra is. Go! Go, go, come on! All right, well, find the signal. You're used. What are you doing? I read, I read this by uh, Seth Williams. He says, never again is someone going to pay you to give them the answers they can look up online. They'll only pay you to solve problems that don't yet have answers to. What are you doing to prepare your students to answer questions, to answer the questions of today, tomorrow? To answer the questions of tomorrow, tomorrow? Can you do that using books? Maybe. Maybe. Can you use that using notepads and material that you've written? over the past five, six years, over the past educational careers that you have? I don't know. And we, what we need in our schools is not more uniformity. What we need is more diversity. More diversity with, re with regards to different children from around the world to come together to be able to solve problems together. So the question is, what are you doing to help your children become global learners? I know one of the schools did a face-to-face -face thing that was an initiative done by Tony Blair. Raise your hand, whoever did it. The, the first school that lectured. That's an awesome initiative. And I commend you for that. You know, Tony Blair set up this foundation to be able to create learning communities worldwide over a Skype session. So they're able to interact together to see what sort of problems they have in their culture, in their countries, in their regions and be able to solve, by dialogue, those problems. And another question is, what are you doing to help your students learn literacy? And I know we heard from the two girls, from the two you know, lovely girls that were here about the Learning Center, etc. What they're doing is they're helping their kids learn literacy, and that is an amazing initiative. And God bless them for that. But what are you doing not just to learn, not just to teach your kids literacy, written literacy, but what are you teaching them about audio literacy? Because that is the way the world functions today. What are you doing in your classrooms, I ask again? And it turns out that our students have access to digital studios that would have cost hundreds of millions of dollars not very many years ago. Movie studios and music studios and printing presses that give them access to the world. That they can carry around in their back pockets or in their backpacks. And I want to come back to the Thomas Edison lab. And like I said, we need to be not building factories, but building educational laboratories. And what we have now at Eastwood College are labs. And I'm not talking about the structural sense of the lab. We're talking about think tanks, where students are able to develop thinking on their own through the use of technology. And that's how we use technology, is to be able to solve problems, to be able to answer questions, to be able to have more dialogue, to be able to have information. You know, the old model was location, 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 but the new paradigm is connection, connection, connection. And what we need to do is we need to take away the reality and replace it with recursivity and isolation with connection and hierarchy with community and simulation with more engagement. And what are you doing in your classrooms, I ask again, to adopt this model for the future learner? We have a dramatic responsibility as educators, as directors, as teachers, as mentors, to lead the future, to lead the coming age into the future. And it turns out that you really don't have to redesign your classrooms. It's been already redesigned for you. All you have to do is prepare your students to live in it. What are you doing to prepare your students to live in it? The past year and a half has been a very challenging one. It's been a very exciting, very fun year. We started our pilot program 
two years ago with 40 kids. And we gave 40 kids iPads just to see what they would do with it. And obviously, like any new technology, there are downsides and upsides. But the upsides always outweigh, and what we found is always outweigh the downsides. In every way. And some of you are thinking, well, they can play games. Well, yes, they can. But where are you as a teacher in terms of handling your teacher, handling your classroom? If they're playing a game on an iPad, where are you as a teacher to be allowing them to play a game? It means that you as a teacher have failed to engage with them, to, to bring out that spark, to bring out that passion in your students. So the question then is about you. What about them? What we did is we wanted to take this iPad and see how it would transform learning. And I actually have a couple of slides afterwards uh, that I may or may not share with you, but I actually want to open it up to a few questions first, and then probably share the slides afterwards. So, with the exception of you, <laughs> does anyone have questions. <laughs> because I'll come to you the last. I'll come to you the last. I'll come to you the last. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Sorry? Alright, so the question here is do your students take the iPads home? Our students own the iPads. We do not own the iPads. And that, we did that for a very smart reason. It's called the liability reason. And we were talking about costs. What's your name? What? Same. So Sam was asking uh, the young lady at the beginning of the, who had the first lecture about how much does this really cost? Well, it costs. It costs a lot. But the costs outweigh the failure of your kids in the future. You want the iPads for them? No. What we did is we actually called Apple, uh, the resellers of Apple called Child Business Machines. We showed them where school were doing this initiative. We want special discounts for our students. And they all afford it? What? Are they wealthy enough to afford it? Are they wealthy enough to afford it? How much does an iPad cost? $800. So wrong. $800. That is wrong. $700. $700 is wrong. <laughs> Alright, the cost of an iPad is between $500 and $600. That is the cost that it takes that they have to pay for books and tuition. It's included in the cost. So, the, the students own their own iPads. So they, they do take it home with them because we want them actively engaged from the minute they get home to the minute they return back to school. What if someone cannot afford to buy a What if someone cannot afford to buy Everyone can afford to buy an iPad. And I can guarantee you that. Everyone can afford to buy an iPad. And there are plenty of initiatives that happen through fundraising, because all our parents, in every school we have some wealthy parents, the top 1%, and some not wealthy parents. That's what I'm saying. So well, not everyone can afford it, but unfortunately, if you, it's funny enough, it's funny enough that how you, when you, when you put the system in place, and you say, this is the road we're going to take, everyone is able to afford it. You'll be very surprised. So is there a microphone? No. So the iPad program this year was this this year was from grade seven to twelve. So the amount of students we have from grade seven to twelve is 135 kids. Then you have 55 staff. 55 staff for the entire school. Correct. We're in the I'm not going to say anything more. Excuse me? Yes. Question? Um, you were, and for the person that said it's not actually a question, it was, uh, it's just a small notice. I realize that you're at some point minimizing the role of a teacher and maximizing the role of, a, of technology and and teaching as a whole. Absolutely On a, on a personal scale. Absolutely No, not, no, not in any negative way. That's how I see it. But at the same time, um, you're, you're depending a lot on technology if you're teaching your kids, but at the same time, you would be blaming the teacher if they have something really complicated between their hands. 
and they can actually go anywhere they want. And the teacher has to play both roles now. The teacher does not keep the eye on them. The last question, please. The last sentence. The teacher has extra and extra responsibility now, in addition to the original responsibility of the teacher. Teach the, teach the lesson and keep an eye on all the iPads in this house, which is actually impossible. Well, the role, okay, thank you for the question. Good question. The role of the teacher has changed. The role of the teacher at Eastwood College has changed because the teacher is no more a classical teacher that sits in front of the classroom and explains all the board. We want to get rid of that system. And we actually did get rid of that system because now the role of a teacher is a facilitator. To be able to facilitate information as streamlined as possible to the children. So, you ask about, is the teacher, will the teacher have time? Have you ever, is that not one of the questions? The responsibility of the teacher, the responsibility of the teacher, the, resp the sole responsibility of the teacher is to be able to engage your students in the right way. So, if using technology is engaging your students, then good for you. But is using technology in order for them to have more information more resources and engaging your students, that makes you an exceptional teacher. And I want you working for me. Did I answer your question? Yes? Yeah. Right, I'm still so, we, You know, we can talk over brunch. Sure. Uh, I'm interested in knowing why you integrated the iPads from 7 and OK. So why we integrated the iPads from 7 and up? Well, we believe that seventh graders have a mental capacity of actually using a tablet and caring for it. Because we're allowing, because we don't give the iPads out in school and we ask the students and parents to purchase an iPad for their kid, that sense of responsibility is very important. <laughs> that sense of responsibility is very important. And what we found is that a lot of material starts on seventh grade. So a lot of the material that we're using, a lot of the resources that we're purchasing for these students start at about seventh grade. Now what we did about two weeks ago is we started the iPad program in nursery classes, but only two hours a week. In nursery, KG1, KG2, and they're only allowed to use it for educational learning twice a week and not more, because we still want to be able to use the pen and paper. We want them to always still be using and refer back to books because books will help. Yeah. Now, um, my question to you is what about the motor skills? What about holding a pen and writing down, um, in, especially in the kindergarten um, uh, degrees or levels? Good question because we have not replaced pens. We are only integrating the iPad, like I said, for only two hours a week, and that's the maximum that I want them integrated on the iPad. And it's for them to get used to knowing that. There is something beyond the pen and paper. So you have two and a half year olds and three year olds coming and they're being actively engaged through these games that we've put for them, through lessons that they're able to draw an A as opposed to drawing an A with a pen and paper. They'll continue drawing and they'll continue writing on pens and paper, but it's just a way for them to come out of the norm. The cost is another issue. You know, one of the, I said I would discuss the downsides. One of the downsides that we've had, and I'll openly say this, is internet. I mean, talk about a government that can't provide internet to institutions. The government's role should be providing internet to educational institutions first. And at a subsidized cost, because the way our, the bulk of our cost, Miss, hi, the bulk of our cost at school, is the internet. Because we spent about $1,500 per campus on internet. That's a lot of money. Because with $1,500, I can guarantee you, I can purchase four iPads and put those four iPads in students' hands to be able to better engage them and, and prepare them for the future. Bulk of our cost goes on the internet, yes. But the bulk, the major bulk of our cost goes to the professional development we give our teachers every year. Professional development is the number one most important thing a student, a, 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 a school needs to invest in. And it's not investment in technology because that's a one-time thing. It's the recurring professional development that you as teachers and you as directors need to submit. We require our staff to have about 150 hours of professional development a year. 
We're developing programs where we're actually sending our staff to learn from sister schools abroad that are also using this technology. So we talk about profits and costs, it goes to that. Any other questions? Yes. One last uh, you stated that the average age uh, of teachers is 37. 36. Is that because uh, older teachers lack the abilities or skills of using technology? Funny enough, the teacher who loves using this technology is 63 years old. <laughs> Believe it or not. She comes to me and she runs to my office every morning. Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, Mr. Clark, look what I did. Look what I did. Look, 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 look at this. Look, look, look. And I'm like, where did you get this energy from? Which brings me back to the passion, the energy, the dedication. So no, have, who, who, who hasn't used an iPad? Honestly, who has not used an iPad? Have you used an iPad? I'm going to get to your question right now. Have you used an iPad? <laughs> All right, iPad, my two and a half year old cousin can open up the iPad, can swipe the unlock, can pick her application and can play with that app. If my two and a half year old, I'm sure you can all handle an iPad. So, you know what? I'm actually not going to be talking about the next six or seven slides because I think this is a lot more fun and you can talk to me uh, outside during brunch. I'll answer two more questions. And, and unfortunately yours. <laughs> so let me answer the two questions in the back and please let these be the only two questions and then I will get to your seven part one question. So that's, that's the um, are there any special needs students in the class? So, I'm sorry? Are there any special needs students in the class? I love this subject. And if yes, how do, you, do, you, do they use the iPad? I can't hear you. If yes, do they use the iPad? Or how? I love this question. Remember how I said that not all students are, 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 are born equal? So, students sometimes have special needs. But some students have to be more challenged, which is part of the gifted program. So yes, in the special needs department, every single student has an iPad. Every single student. And if you actually walk, do you own an iPad? No. Okay, so you own a computer? Yeah. Okay, good. So if you Google special needs applications for iPads, you may get about 10 to 20,000 applications. It's the same exact program. Same exact program. Everyone is equal at Eastwood. Second question, and uh, then I'll sir. And when it comes to assessment and evaluation for grade 7 to 12, how it works, yeah. So what type of assessment are you actually doing? Exams, how do we grade students? But okay, so exams are still on pen and paper, so we haven't gotten rid of them. And quizzes sometimes, some teachers, Ms. Renee I know here, who's uh, our academic dean, she has some quizzes on the iPad and she chooses to do some quizzes on pen and paper. What I'm trying to tell you is, pen and paper is not going to go. But it's the transformational change that you're doing in your classrooms that's going to make your kids make it or break it. Finally, you. Uh, I have three no, very small no, points. No, 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 one. First, uh, I ask you to listen to me and then to feel what I feel. Okay. Do you need an iPad for that? No. This is one. Two, uh, I'm glad that you asked a question, what were we doing 20 or 30 years ago? We were producing information. And now we are using what others are producing and in best terms we are manipulating what others are producing. Lately I've been looking for some articles at international magazines and I, from around 100 to 140 articles I could hardly find three written by Arabs and not, that's not a problem with technology I know. Uh, you know if you could just restrict it to one question that would be great. Listen and feel. Okay. You don't need an iPad. Absolutely. Oh, manipulation of, of information. Okay. Yes. So you say that 25 years ago you were actually producing information. Okay, does that mean that... Not exactly 25. 
Let's say over the past 2,000 years you've been producing information as we've seen with the codex and with the scroll. But does that not mean... Okay, but does that not mean now we're not producing information right now? We are not. We are not. Because I can assure you that if you come up to my school, you will see the production of information by Ms. Renee, by at least 15 or 20 other faculty members of producing online courses and not necessarily manipulation. Because at the end of the day, and funny enough, at the end of the day, all the information, and you as a math teacher, all the information is readily available. And that's the whole point of this topic today. It's true, because math is the same, and has been the same. Because what else are you going to create a math? Because you can't tell me you're, you just adopted a math theory this year. No. What I'm trying to tell you is that in every single subject, the information is readily available at your fingertips. And that's more of a responsibility as you, for you as teachers and for us as, as administrators. Because if we are wrong in the subjects that we are teaching, we can be scrutinized so easily by our students because they have that same type of information, the same type of access to that information. So yes, we're not producing information, but we're manipulating it. But in some cases, we are reproducing and we are repackaging this information to be to help our students become better engaged. So anyway, I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to thank Dr. Bakir and I, I, honestly, and I'll tell you one last thing, we're going to be creating an amazing teacher management program with LAU next year. Something really fascinating with the help of the English department. And uh, we are always looking for the best and the brightest. So if you feel like you want to join this Eastwood team, Please apply, because we're always looking for top-notch members that are young and enthusiastic and passionate and energetic and mathematicians. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.